So we, we had, I thought, a very um, <coughs> interesting and useful first session, really a terrific discussion by the panelists who gave us a view from the countries that are the objects of engagement from both China and Russia. In this session, we'll try to talk it a little bit um, from a higher uh, perspective, in a sense, to look at how China and Russia uh, think about their power and how they apply it. Uh, I'm really delighted that we have such terrific uh, speakers with us, two of whom um, know China and Russia quite well. Uh, Alina Polyakova to my immediate left and Sarah Cook to her left uh, on Russia and China respectively. And then Jacek Kucharczyk, who's written the Polish, uh, the Poland report in our essay. So we have one of the contributors to the reports here. And I, what I might do just by way of introduction is to use uh, a point that was raised by Juan Pablo Cardinal in the first session, where he reminded us that if we had this discussion 15 years ago about China, there would be very little to suggest that uh, China would have the profile it does in Latin America, and frankly, in quite a few other places today. And he gave some startling statistics on the degree of economic engagement in many countries in Latin America. And his argument is that the economic phase of their engagement is now um, evolving, developing into the political phase of their engagement. I would turn the clock back uh, maybe 10 years more and go right to uh, the early 1990s and just remind everyone that at that time the, the widespread assumption was that with the end of the Cold War, democracy would be on the ascension. And to be sure, throughout the 90s it was, uh, that the idea of democracy would be uh, paramount and unchallenged in many ways. And I think certainly for a time at the end of the Cold War that was true. And just to kind of boil all this down for the purposes of this discussion, the notion of soft power was coined right about the same time. It was right at the end of the Cold War, and it was largely put out in the US context as a cautionary note that the US does not rely on its hard power solely at a time it was a hegemon. And I think this is worth considering in this discussion because part of what um, inspired this project was a sense that over the years, the audiences in the Western democracies, uh, analysts, scholars, journalists, not, not for any um, uh, poor intentions or any other identifiable problem, but simply they settled into this term of soft power as something that became um, comfortable, um, kind of a catch-all for this sort of term. But the underlying logic behind the term was the attractive power of a country and its policies, <coughs> the way in which it engages. This is uh, something that uh, Grigory Masishnikov alluded to in the first session as well. And I think what's happened over time is that um, we've tended to look at the sort of uh, influence that Russia and China, as far as it relates to this discussion, kind of the forms of influence they use in the same way as we've understood soft power more generally. So we've looked at spheres that um, are the most visible areas of dimensions of the soft power idea. This is media, culture, education, think tanks which sh shape ideas. And it's always been understood that uh, for these to be effective in a soft power context, they would need to have some sort of uh, affirming nature that they would be attractive. And I think as we've seen Russia and China invest more, uh, engage more, um, it's become more relevant. So in the last decade or so, uh, the, the, the really extraordinary amounts of resources that have been invested into all of the spheres we're discussing here. And so the landscape is rather different today than it was 25 years ago. And for some scholars, for some analysts who've looked at both Russian and Chinese soft power, they've made the following assessment, which is to say, if China is investing billions of dollars in these spheres, and yet it's not enhancing its own image, it's not viewed more favorably in the Pew Global Attitude polls, which is by and large true, certainly in the democracies. In Russia's case, it's even more pronounced. Um, their efforts, widely understood to be soft power efforts, are not enhancing their image, boosting their appeal. And yet they keep investing in these spheres, 
Um, I would suggest that the view from the democracies has kind of lost sight of what these countries are actually doing. Um, the real question is whether the decision makers in Moscow and Beijing see this as something that isn't working and a failure. And if they don't, why is that? Uh, part of what we're suggesting in this report is that the framing, certainly looking from the societies that are now objects of this sort of engagement, has been misaimed and that it needs to be reconsidered um, so that we can properly respond to the sorts of challenges that are there. So if this isn't soft power, what is it? And so we've suggested another term in these cases, and largely because the efforts that the analysts have done this wonderful work and research on suggest that in China's case, it tends to orient itself, not always, but in many respects towards outwardly facing censorship, trying to suppress challenges to the uh, government in Beijing, which by the way is the standard operating system within the PRC. I think this is a terribly important point that um, the, one of the paramount concerns, if not the paramount concerns of the leadership in both of the capitals of the authoritarian <coughs> trendsetters we're examining is to prevent challenges <coughs> to their power. They do this domestically. I think the question is, um, is that the guiding spirit behind what they do internationally, even if they can't do it quite to the same extent they can do it at home, because at home they can largely control and dominate the media. They can suppress and sideline civil society. They can do the same with political opposition. They can control the commanding heights of the economy, such that even though these are notionally capitalist systems, uh, many of the <coughs> firms that are operating are nominally private, but in the end have to adhere to the wishes of the dominant political powers. This is the way the systems operate within these countries' borders. Uh, I think what we need to, th to scrutinize is what aspects of this sort of spirit inform their engagement overseas. And I would just finish with one thought before we move to the speakers, which is often you hear an argument that these countries are simply pursuing their interests, and they surely are. And they should uh, find ways to pursue their interests and their influence. I think the question is the quality and the nature of these interests and influence, because they're certainly animated by values at some level. And I think the very values that animate these countries' governance systems domestically animate what they do beyond their borders, even if they can't actualize and operationalize all of the international activity to the same degree they can retain control domestically. So this I think really struck us by virtue of some of the previous work we had done here, some of the fantastic work that people like Alina and Sarah and Yatsik have done in other contexts. And we felt it was necessary to take a fresh look at this, pose some questions, generate a debate. And so at a minimum, we're hopeful that this uh, exercise will do at least that. And so now I'd like to uh, turn to the speakers and we'll turn first to Alina and as we've seen in, in the Russia case, I think here too, if we were chatting 10 years ago and uh, had a similar discussion about uh, Russia's ability to engage beyond its borders, the sort of activity it would have, it would have been a very benign conversation largely. Even if we had, um, now it's 2017, mm -hmm. so this was maybe just before the uh, cyber attack in Estonia and before the war in Georgia. So there would have, I think, been far less sensitivity to these things. Now that we're, um, we have the benefit of hindsight, I think how would you describe the kind of nature of the influence that Russia is wielding in these visible spheres of media and think tanks and culture? Uh, and how should we uh, interpret those things? Well, thanks, Chris, and congratulations to you and the net and the report. Um, I've had the chance to read most of it. That's really well done. I think an important intervention uh, in the debate. Um, so to go directly to your question, though, uh, the, I like that you framed this as a different kind of influence exertion that we shouldn't think of as public diplomacy, which is how we think of soft power in the West. We think of it as public diplomacy. You know, the U.S. exports Hollywood movies and blue jeans, um, and that's soft power, right? Uh, but what 
Russia has been doing, and I would say this goes back, um, you know, certainly uh, to Putin's uh, coming to power Russia to in the year 2000, but even further back um, to the Soviet days, right? In some ways, what we're seeing coming from Russia today uh, is not that much different from what the Soviets were doing. The tools have changed, uh, but the strategy is, is actually quite similar. Uh, but I think what's interesting is that, as we were talking earlier, in Russian, a better translation for the Russian term for soft power is more like soft force. Um, so the understanding from the Russian side is that this is actually part of their military doctrine. Um, it is actually enshrined in their <laughs> military doctrine that these information operations, the cultivation of political networks, uh, disinformation campaigns, are part and parcel of a spectrum of warfare operations uh, that go all the way from conventional to these very you know, ambiguous, uh, non-conventional measures. Of course, cyber is a big part of that as well. So I if we're looking at Russia 10 years ago, this would be 2006, 2007, uh, I think this is actually when we start to see the beginnings of a much more, uh, as a strategic approach, to develop these tools, implement them first at home, and then deploy them abroad. Again, there's, I think, this pattern between how these regimes treat their own populations as sort of a testing ground for some of these efforts, and then they export that out. Um, and of course, uh, Ukraine has been the number one target of this. Uh, you mentioned Estonia and the cyber attack there in 2007. Uh, in many ways, what has played out in the post-Soviet space, broadly defined, um, is what we saw happening in the United States in 2016, and then what we've seen uh, Russia do in the elections of this year in Europe. Uh, I think it's a long established and very well known pattern, right? There's nothing secret here. Um, in fact, we just weren't paying attention to what the Russians were doing. Um, the cyber attacks, the information, fake news, if you want to call it that, it's not a great term, uh, these various disinformation campaigns. That has all been happening for a long time. And I think if you want to point to a specific day where I think it kind of began, uh, in my view, it's probably around the time that the Russian parliament uh, started rubber stamping these uh, clamp down laws on information control. And that really started actually in 2006, when the first uh, media laws that was passed and amended many times was in 2006 in Russia. And that has, I think, served as a basis for how the Russians have developed their information operations since then. And yet, in many respects, um, there's this sense of equivalence that the term soft power suggested when, um, at least until recent years in Russia's case, and this may still be true in China's case now, where they're simply doing the things that we see as soft power. I mean, that was the, the, the understanding in, Russian, in, in the Russian context. So, Sarah, today, where are we in understanding what China is doing and how the Chinese authorities see what they're doing vis-a-vis -vis democratic societies? Um, I think it's actually really interesting that Alina mentioned this kind of military dimension because in some of the, the language in, in the Chinese government and Communist Party also talks about things like, um, uh, like political warfare and people's war and things like that. So, um, I mean, I think what you have with, with the Chinese case is, um, this came up in the previous panel, I mean, I think there's, there's really two main goals that the Chinese government has in a lot of what it's doing abroad, especially in terms of information. Uh, one is, of course, to promote this benign view of China and particularly of the regime in the Communist Party, uh, as well as to present it as and encourage economic trade and, and, and engagement. And I think the second is, is this more perhaps insidious element of suppressing critical voices. But there's also a third element which speaks to what Juan Pablo had mentioned, which is I think in a lot of cases the economic engagement is really laying the groundwork to create leverage that could be deployed in the future. And in some cases, it may already be used to suppress, to, to, to create incentives uh, to suppress critical voices. But in other ways, um, again, there's these levers of power and influence uh, that are being developed uh, that could be useful at some point in the future, uh, depending on what the Communist Party uh, pr and the Chinese leadership perceive as their interest in a particular country, uh, which could relate to suppressing criticism of what 
uh, is happening back home in China. It could be suppressing criticism or critical coverage of something the Chinese government or Chinese companies are doing in that particular country. Or it could even be, you know, at some point to to try to, you know, to the question of, of influencing or favoring certain candidates in elections and things like that. Um, I think from that perspective, um, uh, what strikes me with in the terms of the inadequacy of the term soft power is there's actually a lot of hard power involved uh, in what the Chinese government does. And uh, I, one is, is this element of economic leverage where, uh, uh, you know, the, the, it's not just that they're giving you money. In some cases, uh, it's quite explicit or uh, it's explicit. In most cases, it's implicit. You know, what you shouldn't do, what are the red lines not to cross, lest that money be... Be, be, be removed. Um, and then in other cases, it's, it's quite overt in terms of punishments. Um, so that when UCSD invited the Dalai Lama to give a commencement speech, uh, very soon after that, a sp scholarship council in China withdrew funding from scholars and Chinese students, who, visiting scholars who were going to be going to UCSD, um, and, and told them to redirect their applications. Um, uh, some of the cultural activities uh, that the Chinese government uses uh, when they're signing contracts uh, with theaters in different parts of the world um, uh, to bring Chinese dance troops uh, are used as leverage to try to get those same theaters to either not sign a contract or cancel a contract with a group like Shen Yun Performing Arts. Uh, that kind of takes an alternative, uh, uh, is, is based here in the U.S. And, and a very alternative perspective on, on, on China uh, than what the Communist Party would like to promote. Um, so you have this situation where in some cases we're already seeing how, uh, again, the, se the seemingly benign or, or more positive elements of Chinese funding uh, and outreach, relationship building, are actively used to uh, suppress critical voices, suppress freedom of expression, suppress economic opportunities uh, for certain entities that are deemed uh, unfavorable by the Communist Party. Um, and then I think the other element is uh, more old-fashioned coercion and intimidation. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're a Chinese journalist at a newspaper here in the United States or anywhere else, you've got family back in China. I mean, and they, they, they use this kind of pressure. Um, uh, I mean, it, this was a, a, German, a journalist who's in Germany who's, whose family was intimidated because of some of his activism. Um, but it's not just Chinese. Um, a few years ago, uh, this came up in a report I wrote for, for the NED uh, a few years ago regarding uh, the, the long shadow of Chinese censorship. Uh, a, a, a kind of overseas Chinese television station here in New York was reporting, that's independent of the, of the Chinese government, quite critical, was reporting from NASDAQ. And somehow the Chinese government got wind of it. They actually detained and questioned NASDAQ's representatives in China to pressure them to stop have this group of uh, this media reporting. And unfortunately, NASDAQ conceded. But again, there's that those are real elements of, of hard force, of, 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 of hard power, of intimidation, of using public security bureau forces back in China. Certainly uh, these questions of um, uh, denying scholars who are critical of China, uh, of visas. Um, so, so I think one of the things that I thought was refreshing with the, the question of sharp power is I think it points to that, that there's this hard edge. Um, to what, what these, the, and I think this may be a difference between Russia and China, because in the sense that, that the Chinese, the Russian uh, tactics, and I, and I mean, are, are, are more, are this kind of distortion, manipulation, disinformation. The Chinese government does that too, but there's, uh, there's this very strong element of, of, of intimidation uh, and coercion. Uh, involved in, 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 in some of the things the Chinese government is doing overseas to shape perceptions uh, of, of China and other places. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll pause there, but I think uh, what Juan Pablo was saying also about this question of phase one uh, in terms of some of the economic engagement and phase two in terms of the political influence, that's what we're seeing now really bubbling up in places like Australia and New Zealand already. And so this is a good segue to Yatsek because <coughs> the the very significant engagement, albeit nascent, in Central Europe with the 16 plus 1 initiative that China is undertaking. I think it's, it's still a bit murky to many people, both within the region and outside it, what it entails, what uh, the ultimate aims are. Um, given Sarah's assessment of this, uh, the pattern that emerges and the trajectory of China's engagement, what is your sense, both from the perspective of Poland, but maybe the, the region more uh, 
widely of how people are reacting to China's engagement, how they see what many, if you do a quick search, um, China and Central Europe, you'll probably find the term soft power <coughs> connected with many of the headlines in the writing about the 16 plus one. What's your sense of how this uh, interpretation fits from a from the Central Europe perspective. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, indeed. I mean, first of all, <laughs> I wanted to thank everybody in the NED uh, uh, for for doing this project, this very important project on both Russia and China. I think that that this was a great opportunity to look at more in depth into this uh, these uh, um, activities, which we again we used initially the concept of soft power or public diplomacy but it quickly became obvious that these concepts don't really fit to describe what the the russians and the chinese are doing in the in the region and in my case in in poland so i i think that that uh, the whole um, uh, research and, and uh, the, the findings or conclusions point out to the need to, to introduce this new concept of, of, of sharp, pow sharp power and, uh, and uh, uh, that, that uh, it, it helps us to understand better for uh, both the Russian and Chinese activities. Uh, and the, the, the main thing, before I go to China, I wanted to say is that the main quality that distinguishes soft and sharp power, in, in my view, is that, uh, as you mentioned, and it was mentioned in the previous uh, report, that it's not really about winning hearts and minds and creating positive image of these uh, uh, countries, but it's rather about sowing political di divisions both within the countries when the, 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 this, this operates, but also between different countries. So in Poland, for example, one of the aims I, I claim in my report of Russian power is to reinforce the uh, uh, problems between Poles and Ukrainians. It's one of these uh, anti-Ukrainian narratives are, are very, very important uh, elements and instruments of, of Russian soft power. When it comes to China, that one might think that uh, uh, at the face value that Chinese activities um, re resemble uh, that sort of what you would understand as soft power a little bit more than the Russian activities, which th there is a general consensus that, that uh, Russians uh, are there to uh, using this as an offensive weapons. In the Chinese uh, 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 case, there, there is an obvious attempt to overcome some image difficulties that China has in the region and in Poland in particular, stemming from the simple fact that, that, that uh, 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 China is a communist country and, and the, the, the first uh, uh, um, association, at least some years or decades ago with China, was, uh, was uh, uh, communism. I mean, it's, it's, it's a nice uh, uh, illustration of this, this perception, the fact that uh, the date of Tiananmen Massacre, uh, the 4th of uh, June 1989, is also the date of Polish free elections where solidarity defeated the communists. So basically for my generation, for the generation of people who with witness transformation, <coughs> uh, we always thought about Chinese who, as, as a country that failed to move on from, from communism. That was the initial perception. And indeed, some Chinese academics writing about the region and the problems that they have with public diplomacy said that the whole problem is that those former dissidents who are now in power and they don't like us because we are still communists. But uh, when I looked at, at this, uh, the, the, the Chinese activities 20 or more years later, I see a very different picture. So there is 16 plus 1, and there is the new image of China, and which is a combination of this uh, new super super modern and super uh, uh, quickly growing economy so this uh, economic powerhouse uh, as well as this traditional um, uh, very old and and respectable culture and and the general projection of this feeling of benevolence and of course if you if you look more closely this is uh, this is um, this, this doesn't look so benevolent, uh, and some of the uh, elements of this this element of coercion have been mentioned. But I all wanted to focus here on on um, uh, the fact that that uh, this uh, Chinese uh, influence uh, goes beyond uh, promoting chi China's economic interests and and general political interests. 
uh, uh, and and has actual impact on uh, democracy and the commitment to democracy in in Central and Eastern Europe. So the the first paradox, if you look at 16 plus one, and especially on Poland, is that uh, ostensibly it's all about economic cooperation and creating and taking advantage about economic opportunities. But in fact, uh, when you analyze what the Chinese are doing, is that it turns out that when they invest, they in would rather invest in Germany or the UK and the investment in Poland, for example, is, is relatively small and especially if you compare it to, uh, uh, to, to investment from our Western partners, the same concerns trade. I mean, the Polish exports to China, as last time I checked, was about a billion dollars, whereas the Polish exports to European Union are 120 something billion dollars. I mean, this give you the, the proportions of this, this whole, I mean, you can see how blown up is this, this whole image of economic opportunity. But most important is actually the fact that China has established itself in the mind of at least a part of the Polish political um, political class, especially I would say that these views are popular on the far right, which is, which is uh, uh, very responsive to this view of China as systemic and geopolitical alternative to the, to the status quo. Uh, so, so basically the idea is that liberal democracy and open markets <coughs> are not very good for Poland uh, and th that the Chinese present an alternative model with strong meaning authoritarian government, which sort of enhances and speeds up uh, economic development and actually uh, makes sure that, that the, uh, the, the, the results are shared for the people. And this alternative may be seen as a, as a byproduct of, of Chinese politics, but I think it's more than that. I have come across this really interesting quote from, um, from President Xi, uh, hold on, this was from the 19th uh, uh, Party Congress uh, that uh, and and uh, let me just get this 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 night quote yes the quote went like this from Pro President G uh, Xi Jinping China represents a new option for other countries and nations who want to speed up their development while preserving their independence. And this is this is very nice quote if you look at all sorts of right wing fora in Poland commenting on <coughs> China, Chinese affairs. I mean this is basically the message that, that gets across, but not only on the margin of politics, because I have another nice quote from the recent uh, sixteen plus one summit in, in Budapest from President uh, from uh, uh, Hungary's Prime Minister uh, Orban and he said something like this. It has beca become increasingly offensive that a few developed countries have been continuously lecturing most of the world on human rights, democracy, development, and, ma and the market economy. Uh, Orban said during the television appearance, everyone has had enough of this, and of these, the Chinese are the strongest, which really shows you directly how countries like Hungary, which are basically, I think this is the agreement in, in the process of democratic backsliding, are looking at China as an encouragement and as an alternative to Western style democratic institutions so that the, you, you can see that there is in, uh, authoritarian influence and I think that Chinese are perfectly aware of this and, 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 and encourage this uh, and, and this is part of the, the, the political agenda for Central and Eastern Europe. So maybe I'll, I'll use your observations as a way to move towards um, a discussion of some of the media enterprises that have been undertaken, which uh, our panelists are familiar with, uh, as a way of, of thinking about the soft, sharp power discussion. And we can come back to some other issues after that. But I, it strikes me that at some level, what you just described, Jacek, in terms of communicating these ideas, Sovereignty is an idea which no one's really going to argue with, but what tends to come out of the um, uh, information outlets in Russia and China is this absolutist version, often a distorted version of, of these sorts of ideas. And on the one hand, those outlets, and we can discuss a little bit the extent to which they're watched and what impact they have and so forth, are embedded in our societies. And at the same time, China and Russia in recent years have dislodged uh, independent news outlets, both those that are domestic and homegrown, 
and those that broadcast from the outside. And there's a whole range of them. And this is in the news this week on a, on a number of fronts. But I think here, too, uh, certainly until recently, this sense of uh, equivalence mm -hmm. of outlets which you know, the BBC doesn't seek to monopolize news, as far as I can tell, or to silence critics or intimidate them, whereas, as Sarah noted, this is true in the Chinese state media case. This is part of the modus operandi. So um, maybe, Alina, if you would just say a few words about how we should understand these information enterprises, mm -hmm. which until, let's face it, quite recently were viewed as media outlets and any number of people to say, <coughs> well, RT is just, just like the BBC or AFP or, is that true? No. <laughs> uh, but before I get to that, I wanted to just pick up one comment that I think you made, Sarah, about the difference between Russia and China being this Im intimidation, the, the hard force behind the the, uh, the the soft power, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, I do want to make it clear that in the in the Russian case, that is also mm -hmm. the same. Um, you know, the the amount and number of Russian journalists that are harassed, that are killed, um, that face constant constant harassment in Russia, and not just Russian citizens, also Western journalists who are working for RFERL um, or VOA um, are beaten. Some are jailed, um, and they and the the Russians in recent years have gone to great lengths to pursue critics um, who are not in Russia anymore. It used to be that people thought they were safe if they left, but they're not. Uh, just in D.C., I mean, this is probably a case most of you have heard about now. Um, Lesin, um, who actually set up RT um, at one point, uh, was very close to Putin, was found mysteriously dead at Dupont Circle Hotel, and we don't really know why um, he died, uh, but there's all suspicion that he was uh, about to have a conversation with the U.S. Um, law enforcement agencies when he was here. And there's so many examples of this. And I think this is, again, why this is such an ambiguous distinction that we like to draw, when in reality, it doesn't exist. The line between soft power um, or asymmetrical active measures, I think is a better term for that in the Russian case, um, and conventional or intimidation like that is a spectrum. And you know, when we try to separate it out for analytical convenience, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, and this it brings me to RT. Um, you know, as I, I assume most are aware that RT uh, registered as a foreign agent in the United States um, last month. Um, and quickly after that, uh, President Putin signed into law uh, uh, sort of a media foreign agent law that has ex extended <coughs> the laws on the books that Russia already has, basically allowing it to call any Western media a foreign agent. And of course, what that means in Russia is very different than what it means here. And this gets to your direct qu uh, question, is RT like the BBC? Uh, well, there's a few key differences between other state-funded outlets versus RT, and I think these are important. Um, one, there's transparency in the funding structure for the BBC, for example. Uh, we all know where the BBC gets its money. It gets its money from a household tax in the UK. Uh, we know exactly what its budget is. There's an independent board of um, supervisors that oversees uh, the BBC activities. Um, and you know, I think beyond that, just one very clear uh, kind of test or litmus test uh, of when you're looking at any outlet. Um, you know, RT is funded by Russia. So what? Well, have you ever seen RT? If you dare to watch it, um, you know, criticize the Kremlin or Putin? No, I guarantee you have never seen any criticism of Putin's foreign policy, of domestic issues in Russia on RT. The BBC, on the other hand, and also <laughs> uh, NPR, for example, this seems to be that's all they do, is criticize their own governments, right? <laughs> so there's a very clear, just substantive line there beyond you know, having to look into the financial structures and the um, independent editorial structures and all of that. Um, so that's a very clear line. And I think we fall into this moral equivalence, um, not just in the case of these outlets, but in general, you know, well, um, the Russians uh, invaded Ukraine. Well, the U.S. has invaded Iraq. Aren't we all bad guys, right? Um, and unfortunately, this is something that many people, including President Trump, have also said. Um, but I think we fall into that falsely, um, and we have to be really aware that when we see things like this, it's usually because we don't have information about the things we're comparing, right? Um, 
if you don't know, so, as, like it's comparing apples and oranges, but if you don't know what an orange is and you've only had apples, maybe you'll think an orange is just a different kind of apple, right? So I think we need to have more information. We need to have terms to define what's actually happening. Um, and you know, just very briefly, I don't mean to go on about this, but I think you know, this reciprocity question, and I'd be interested in hearing on the China side as well. Um, this has been actually in the US media. When RT registered as a foreign agent here, lots of US media said in a reciprocal action, reciprocal action uh, in response to US uh, enforcement of FARA, the foreign agent law on RT, the Russian government has passed this law. There's no reciprocity there. Uh, first of all, US government funded outlets like RFRL and VOA have been banned from Russia since 2012 and 2014. So they haven't had any operations there. Um, and the media li uh, outlets they want to put on this foreign agent list are actually independent media. Um, they're Western media, like New York Times or CNN or whatever. We don't know exactly who's going to be on that list. But they're also just Russian independent media. Um, and so the Kremlin clearly uses these very complex network of legal mechanisms um, to repress and stifle independent voices. And it doesn't actually matter if these are Western or domestic uh, NGOs or media organizations. And in this case, as I understand it, RT still broadcasts of on course. here without yes. obstruction. But as you note, the content coming from uh, a range of broadcasters into Russia is blocked and obstructed. Exactly. So. Right. So far registration is not about the First Amendment, which is how RT has spun this and how the Russian government has spun this. That the U.S. is being hypocritical, um, that we are not committed to the, o to the values we say we're committed to, which is free <coughs> speech. But any organization or individual that registers under FARA still can go on doing you know, his, her, its business. There's no restrictions or censorship. And so in the China case, how do you see the kind of media engagement and the way it's perceived in, in say, democratic settings? Um, I think there's a, a big difference between the Chinese language uh, and the English language. Uh, I mean, Chinese language media, the, the, the Chinese government has been much more successful uh, in saturating the market, uh, in uh, co-opting, uh, in some cases, through uh, private media that are originally owned in Hong Kong or Taiwan and their media owners. Um, and actually, CCTV is per the Chinese pervasive here in the United States. Uh, it's like we looked at the market data um, at just like everywhere, um, even in all kinds of places where there are probably not even any Chinese speakers. Um, uh, you compare that to the market penetration of uh, some Taiwanese outlets uh, that are a little bit perhaps more critical of China or at least more pro-Taiwan, much less market access. Uh, on cables is on cable, and then more independent like overseas dissident initiatives like New Tang Dynasty TV, almost none that they've had trouble actually getting onto cable here in the United States. And other places like Australia and New Zealand, I don't even if know if there's even much competition. So you have a situation where in the Chinese language sphere, for people who are in the Chinese diaspora, uh, men, uh, va vast major many of them are getting their news directly from Chinese state-run media. Um, I think when you're looking at uh, the foreign language and, and the degree to which uh, an entity like CGTN uh, is really being able to uh, influence or, or, or gain an audience and traction, um, I, I don't know as much in terms of like, you know, like the Spanish versions and things like that. Uh, I think in the English speaking world, it's much more difficult for them. Uh, when I looked at like, you look at like some of the YouTube statistics though, because it's very hard to get like user ratings. And like their videos have like, you know, 100 views or something like that. Uh, a few hundred views. These aren't exactly things that are going viral. Actually, some of these activists and other dissident initiatives have many more <laughs> views that are critical of the Chinese government. So the, if you actually look at, the, and, and online rankings are much higher. So if you actually look at the demand online and the way this plays out in the more balanced market than in some of the more tightly controlled cases, cable television, the, you actually see that when there is competition and alternatives, uh, even the Chinese speaking uh, communities, uh, people like that uh, and, and they will want to have those, those alternative perspectives and views. Um, but I think what becomes more insidious is, uh, and more effective is this, uh, this penetration of, of Chinese state media content uh, into existing uh, uh, outlets, uh, whether it's in the form of these paid supplements, um, or in the form of Xinhua Newswire content, 
Um, or one of the things that's been happening in Africa is that through some of the digitization uh, and the transition from analog to digital with regards to television, uh, you're getting displacement of, of some things like CNN or BBC and more uh, uh, CCTV Africa. Uh, I, for I forget which, maybe I think it was in Kenya, there was some kind of nightly evening news broadcast uh, that until recently, at like you know, 11 p.m. or whatever, uh, was either BBC or CNN, I can't remember which one, uh, and is now CGTN. Uh, CGTN. Um, and so from that perspective, if you look at the reporting, so you're going to get a very particular perspective on China. You're also going to get a particular perspective on Africa itself um, uh, and, and a different kind of perspective on, on, on the West. Uh, but I think really, you know, similar to what, what Alina was saying about RT, you don't have independent editorial policies. Uh, you don't have space for journalists to really explore and critically uh, investigate uh, uh, various kinds of, of, of information. Uh, it, it's very cl closely controlled messaging. So I, I think it's that uh, insinuation uh, of content. Um, and they have a term for it. It's called barring the boat to reach the sea um, uh, in order to, to basically use existing outlets to reach audiences. I think that's generally more effective. What you're starting to see now is then this question of the ownership and potential <laughs> buyouts. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the kinds of things that in some of the recent writings um, uh, you see talking about buying the boat. You don't have to use the boat to reach the sea, just buy the boat. Um, and then one last point regarding uh, what Yatsik had mentioned and that, that quote from Xi Jinping in the 19th Party Congress. If we're looking at kind of the different phases and what has China been doing up until now and what may be changing, that was actually quite a change to have Xi Jinping be that overt about China now is going to promote itself and its model and political and economic system as a model for developing countries. They do that implicitly. They've actually tried to shy away from this idea that they're presenting an alternative China model. When you look at some of the kinds of trainings that they do for officials, it's clear that they're training them in information control, whatever, the way, you know, Ethiopian officials, the way the Chinese government does it. But I think the fact that she really stated this as one of like the key talking points as part of his three and a half hour long speech um, <laughs> uh, at the party congress, it really is going to be signaling uh, that we're going to see see more of that type of explicit potential explicit promotion uh, of of China's uh, political economic system as a model for other countries. And just staying on this theme for a moment, <coughs> you know, <somebody coughs> suggested that in a number of key respects, the content being generated in certain quarters by Chinese state media is not that effective. And for example, there aren't many views on the YouTube channel in certain instances. Um, I think it was quite similar in Russia's case not all that long ago. In RT, for example, which has very low viewership, yep. as a practical matter, has some very impressive uh, YouTube numbers. And so I think, and I'm getting to a question to Yatsik on this from his report, um, you know, the, the ability of um, large states to invest and adapt and improve is there. And so I don't assume that you're suggesting that we yeah. shouldn't worry about China's ability, the Chinese state's ability to kind of marshal approaches that could be more effective in that space. And I would just say, say I, that absolutely is true. And that also is this idea of telling China's story to the world is an explicit also priority and something that from the highest echelons of the Communist Party, these media outlets have been tasked with. So I wouldn't be surprised if they begin adapting and trying to do things in a, be in a better way, in a more engaging way, maybe taking some pages from Russia's book. Uh, maybe you, I mean, we know that they're using, to some extent, uh, you know, Facebook ads and things like that uh, to target certain audiences with certain stories. So I wouldn't be surprised <coughs> if in the next few years they start doing more of that. And in, in your report, you very, um, <coughs> it, it's really surprising to read that a country like Poland that has a history with Russia, uh, tragic history in so many ways where so many lives have been lost um, over the decades and beyond um, that Russia through its surrogates or through um, several degrees of separation is still able to marshal mostly online through social media or through certain uh, websites uh, the sort of clusters of activity that are designed to amplify the sorts of things that would divide polls from Ukrainians or to raise doubts about the integrity of the arrangements with key transatlantic institutions. 
And so in, in this age, and this is relevant to a question that was asked in the, in the last um, session, in a way the, what we're seeing in so many respects now is that modern technology, social media, and the um, access that these new forms of media and technology offer uh, present a whole another degree of challenge for countries like Russia and China to express their influence in the realm of ideas. So maybe you can just say a word about mm -hmm. how these clusters of um, information outlets affect uh, the discussion in Poland. It's, I indeed, if you, I with, with the Polish, I would say healthy suspicion of anything coming from Russia, uh, the, the viewership, the direct viewership of Russian channels is, uh, or, or radio channels, it's, it's rather small. So you, 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 you would say that the, the impact cannot be too big. But if you look more closely about the, the, the role uh, the, of the official media like RT in this whole ecosystem, you will find out that uh, they, they provide content which then goes through several layers. Uh, is reproduced on YouTube, then uh, people uh, very often removing the information on where it comes from, are using it for domestic political debates, uh, and it, it gets the life of its own. So it's, it's, it's real impact, and it's uh, especially that it's when it targets very sensitive issues, it's much bigger than uh, you would uh, uh, figure out from just looking at the numbers of, of viewers uh, of, of RT. There was a very interesting example recently when one of the m members of European Parliament, Polish members, tweeted a short piece of information about German hypocrisy in, in the case of, of uh, uh, <coughs> uh, basically it was about, about forests that the Germans cut down and at the same time European Commission is uh, suing Polish government for cutting down forests. So it, it, it became like circulating on Twitter, but what was re-edited from this original tweet was the, the source of this information, which was actually from RT. And uh, uh, I, I suppose that was identified, but of course, knowing the separation of, of, uh, of audiences, the information that it's from RT only reached certain group, whereas it, it gained a life of its own in, in this other uh, other circle. So it, it shows you quite well how, how this is uh, uh, this is uh, this is being used, and and it also shows certain uh, general quality, I think, of, of this sharp power. It's uh, it's not only that it's divisive, but also it's opportunistic, that is they uh, basically it's used to amplify certain issues very uh, politically or socially controversial and then uh, add to this, uh, to this amplification and thus to increase uh, political, uh, political polarization. So that's, I, I would say it's a very important uh, feature of, 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 of this, this strategy. And the third thing was already mentioned by you, the lack of transparency. So that, that was a very big challenge for researching this. And it's not only about media, but also about think tanks, all these cultural exchanges, uh, the funding, uh, all these organizations about which I would claim uh, are amplifying some of these Russian narratives. Uh, uh, there is almost no information, for example, where the funding comes from. It's, it's this, this general, general lack of uh, a lack of available information, which is not only the feature of the, the media uh, uh, promotion, but but also on the, the, the general, uh, I would say, quality about about this uh, soft power. And the same is true, of course, about the Chinese or sh sharp power. I wanted to say the Chinese sharp power. So. I'd like to start integrating some questions from the audience. I'm going to just ask for one more set of thoughts from the panelists first. We, as part of this effort, and you've all described the, the scope <coughs> of the activity and the challenge, and the first panel also described uh, how in recent years the investments and engagement has grown so significantly, certainly in the spheres that we examined, and there's surely others. Ours was a fairly narrow piece of, of this uh, larger question. Uh, but we've, we're suggesting that part of what needs to happen, given the opacity in so many instances, and as the reports point out in, in the Chinese case, and I think this is true in the Russian case as well, that it's often not clear either objectively or certainly to the, the local audiences who they're necessarily engaging. 
So they may think that a group coming is just a kind of non-governmental organization and they don't quite understand how those relationships work in, in China. That part of this is to um, enhance the understanding of how China and Russia work in countries that are you know, young democracies, maybe smaller countries on the one hand, how to unmask the forms of influence. And I think this is happening in some respects already, where groups are kind of marshalling their uh, resources to shine more of a light in the way that uh, Yatsik and others did in, in this report. But what else do you think, given what we know, should be happening now? I mean, what else, um, for example, in, in, the, in the Europe context, where uh, certainly since the annexation of Crimea, the sensitivity has been elevated and there have been some reactions, but in your view, to, to address what is being defined as sharp power, mm -hmm. what sorts of things would uh, be most useful for us to keep in mind? Well, I think there's probably a few things. Um, just very quick comment. I think, Yatsek, you had made a, a comment about investment um, and how much you know, EU countries invest in Eastern European countries versus uh, Russia, let's say. But what's interesting is that uh, there's a survey of the Balkans. And if you ask people, uh, where, where do you think, which country do you think is doing most for your country? People thought that Russia was investing significantly more than the EU completely false, right? But again, this goes back to the point of, you know, why do these operations matter? And that they're not about projecting uh, a certain image, a positive image of the country, because that's actually quite irrelevant. So you have the majority of people in the country to think that, you know, Russia or China is a better friend to you because they're investing economically and they're not, that will structure the orientation of those countries um, in, in the future, whether they want to be Western oriented or not. Right, um, but uh, you know, to go back to to the point that you were saying, Chris, about what should we do? I think it has to start one with the acknowledgement, which you um, said at the onset, that these operations, uh, these sharp power operations, are possible because we allow them to be possible. We allow Western institutions to be used and manipulated in the service of these malicious actors. Um, that goes to financial sector. Uh, this goes to the transparency question about funding. Uh, the only glimpse we see of this very complex network of shell companies um, that are used to launder money, <coughs> that, that are used to fund civil society organizations or media outlets is from these leaks, uh, the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. Uh, but there's, there's clearly a lot more that we can do to force international financial institutions um, to be much more transparent and accountable to where they're taking money from, right? So that's number one. I think the other set of actors that uh, need to be more transparent um, are the social media companies. Uh, again, how is all of this information, disinformation spreading? We all, we all know that very well now. All, what we suspected, um, as I was just watching what the Russians have been doing for a long time, is that you know Twitter was being manipulated, that their trending topics were being manipulated, and of course this topic is trending, then the traditional media start to report on it because they think it's important, um, that there are bot armies, troll armies, Facebook. But again, this all goes back to what many of us suspected but didn't know because these companies never <laughs> looked into this, they never shared information, they thought they were kind of um, immune or beyond it, right? And so now we're seeing more pressure on the social media firms, but uh, frankly, I think they're still not taking this very seriously and they're not doing very much. But there's another set of actors that I think we really need to focus on. In, in Europe, for example, um, there's some precedent for more regulatory action uh, where the tech companies have signed on to this uh, voluntary code of conduct um, in the case of hate speech. This could easily be, I think, extended to also cover disinformation or clearly propaganda efforts that seek to undermine democratic processes. So there is a lot of precedent uh, already, but I think right now we're a bit of a <coughs> watersh you know, watershed for these firms and also I hope for the banks as well. And this is clearly a terribly important dimension of this because one of the things that you see that had different trajectories broadly speaking in the democracies compared with Russia and China is that the uh, investments in the health of uh, serious media really eroded uh, 
certainly after the financial crisis, in so many democracies, which means that there was less of an ability to scrutinize, um, have a meaningful understanding of what was going on so that we don't permit these sorts of things to happen within the democracies, and at the same time, uh, enormous resources being invested of all sorts from those very large uh, non-democratic settings into the democracies. And I think uh, this was also underestimated. Either one of those would be a problem, but happening together is a big problem. And in China's case, you know, the investments aren't in question. The numbers that all of the people who follow this closely put those kinds of investments into the many billions of dollars. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, there, there are a few things. I mean, one, I think that the case of what's been happening in Australia is quite interesting in a positive sense of the power of mainstream media investigations into unveiling this, into connecting the dots between the people back in China and the Communist Party and the United Front Work Department and a particular pol a funder, a donor to a particular politician, um, and you know the level of, of, of uh, surveillance over Chinese students in Australian universities and things like that. So I think in terms of uh, you know media being able to investigate this or perhaps media uh, you know development donors you know who, you know giving opportunities and resources for media in countries where it might be economically difficult. Uh, both to set aside money for that or because of advertisement from the Chinese, you know, to, to kind of shift those incentives um, uh, to, to raise these issues, I, I think that that's, that's very important. Um, I think uh, there was a great report on Confucius Institutes that the National Association of Scholars did. There were a number of things there related to transparency uh, in terms of changing some of the regulations about what kind of gifts need to be reported. Uh, and whether gifts in kind and things like that need to be reported by uh, uh, universities in the United States because some of those things are now related to Confucius Institutes are falling below uh, the radar of some of those, those thresholds. But I think also one of the things that came up in that report is that I think as some of the, the issues and the problems related to Confucius Institutes have come up, even in universities that have not decided to close the Confucius Institutes, they've been in a bit of a process of renegotiating some of the contracts and providing greater oversight and giving and matching the Chinese teachers with academic advisors or, or, or faculty at the actual university or other ways in which, and then I, I mean I think in terms of negotiating initial contracts, putting in very clear language on the part of the university about academic freedom, about the space for conversations, about saying that you know, s saying that, that certain things will not be, be able to be dictated and certain space will be protected. So I think Knowing what we know now, I think as various institutions and democracies engage with the Chinese government and receive uh, funding, either from direct or from indirect sources, just being cognizant uh, and, and uh, early on uh, putting in a position, um, uh, especially if there's something kind of a collective thing. So for example, if you had a situation where like the whole UC system did something, um, or, or, and this is one of the things that's come up in Australia also on the university side, uh, these kind of coalitions that also protects uh, from backlash uh, from the Chinese government. And the last um, thing I would say I think related to, it's a bit on the media side, is one of the new tactics that, well not so new, but it's come up in Australia are actually lawsuits now. So I think in terms of having various legal, and this is not actually only, there have been some cases in other places regarding Chinese state-linked entities trying to sue journalists and media outlets uh, who have tried to expose what's been going on. That is, you have media starting to dig into this, very, making sure that uh, some of the legal protection funds that may already exist in terms of protecting journalists, maybe wor often working much more hostile environments, uh, be able to be applicable to this so that uh, journalists can be protected uh, uh, if they are reporting on and investigating this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, is, my, is my understanding correct that the agreements between the Confucius Institute <coughs> and the universities typically are not? No, yeah, they're not transparent. They're very, they're, right. they're very difficult to, oh, I, well, I don't know, I think one Pablo said that. I think he had some anecdotes about how difficult it was to get. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're not necessarily uh, uh, transparent. So that would be another thing. I mean, the other thing, other things related to discrimination. I think a big part of it is just that realizing that just the way the Chinese government does these things, often just the way it's being done violates uh, various fundamental principles of how either uh, a democracy would work, or in the case of the EU, certain elements of a market economy. 
uh, and, and I think that's come up in the 16 plus one, this, these, these questions, that, that uh, being, being more cognizant of protecting that. So you're just basically, you're going to say, look, I'm sorry, we just, you know, we, this, this is who we are, this is what we are, these are the laws in our country, and potentially for civil society also, you know, in some cases where there might be a violation to be able to challenge that in the courts and things like that, um, to just keep that basic threshold of this is how our system works. If you want to come here, you have to play by our rules, which is basically what the Chinese government does, you know, in the, the other sense of the word on their end. Where they're like, look, Apple, if you want to be here, you know, we think VPNs are illegal and we think the New York Times app is illegal, so you have to follow Chinese law and remove them. But like, th you don't really see that same kind of response on the other side where like, look, if the Confucian says wants to come here, we need to have, you know, some, you know, role in the uh, hiring process to make sure that you're not discriminating against various religious or ethnic minorities and people who might be wanting to come and teach here. One might suggest that from the very outset of the Confucius Institute, <coughs> the very fact it was seen as soft power just had everyone surmise that they were operating in a way that that would happen on its own. And that was, I think, an incorrect assumption. So let's hear from Yatsek and uh, then we'll take some questions that the panelists can respond to. Yeah, I mean, on, on Confucius Institute, there was this interesting incident in, in, in Poland where at Warsaw University, a relatively small group of students staged a protest against the plans to open it. And uh, my understanding is that at least managed to delay it quite significantly. That is that so, so sometimes the activity of, of even a small group of people who are aware of, of what it is about can, can go quite a long way. I, I think it was an I interesting precedent. But uh, more generally speaking, I wanted to make this, uh, this uh, one uh, uh, remark that if we ask ourselves what to do with sharp power, I would say we need smart power to counter sharp power. So not just go back to the business as <coughs> usual, maybe with more resources and, and uh, promote our soft power, our meaning the, the democratic community, but be really smart about it. And what this means is that I think that there are two responses very often to, to to both Russian and Chinese uh, sharp power, which is either paranoia or complacency. And paradoxically, this is what I saw in the Polish study, uh, is that they tend to reinforce each other because some of the conspiracy theories about Russian involvement basically generate a backlash and every, every talk about Russian involvement becomes to be treated as a conspiracy theory. So I, I think we should really be very, very much aware how we talk about it and be as, as, as substantive, of, as evidence-based as possible in, and provide some evidence. So I, I think that would be one sort of <laughs> commandment uh, of, of how to do it. The second is obviously transparency and demanding uh, uh, as much transparency uh, as possible. Uh, my my uh, third idea would be the importance of diasporas. Uh, I think that, that there, there were all these cases when we saw how diasporas were being used for uh, promoting certain political purposes, but I mean, in the Polish case, for example, we have we have a, a, a relatively significant Russian diaspora of people who escape from uh, Mr. Putin, and I, I think they they should be partners in really uh, in in the whole Europe's conte uh, context. I, I think this is this is a possible potential resource in actually countering and raising awareness about what's going on in Russia and what the Russians are doing. So I think, and Jessica mentioned the the importance of diaspora, and I I want. Uh, very, very much uh, to, to support that. And my last point, uh, going back to this idea of smart power, we shouldn't do, I, I think, <laughs> we shouldn't do anything which plays into this idea of moral equivalence. So, for example, I, I, I would really uh, have strong doubts whether uh, naming RT uh, foreign agent uh, I mean, with all the differences uh, that, that we are aware of, but it, it really uh, plays into the Russian, <coughs> Russian uh, hands and Russian propaganda, because before you explain what the difference is, I mean, the, the, the word spreads out. Yes, so, so basi basically that the Russians are not doing anything different that, uh, that US or Europe is doing, so 
basically where's the problem here so i i think we should we should avoid uh, avoid uh, everything that that uh, that uh, that uh, sort of uh, is is basically the sort of very direct response and which may look like like reinforcing this this feeling of of symmetry or or moral equivalence because there is no moral equivalence here you want to give a quick response? Just very quickly, um, I think if you follow that logic, that means we should do nothing. No. Because everything <laughs> we do will be spun. It doesn't actually matter. The, what the Russians are doing now is not reciprocity uh, for our TV in the foreign agent. They should have been, Ria Novosti was on the foreign agent list for three years, and nobody made a big deal about it because the Russians, this was in 2003, 2005, because the Russians didn't really weren't in that place where they were willing to do that. Um, Taz, the Soviet news agency, was on the also on the foreign agent list. Some Chinese agencies. Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, so I think part of it's actually a rule of law thing in the United yeah. States. It's not just, I, thought, I mean, if you look at the list, there are Canadians registered under the foreign that's agent right. law. Right. There are people, Benin, Cameroon. I mean, it's just like really from all over the world. And actually, I think it is a question of a rule of law. If, if you have a law that's supposed to govern this, and there are gaping gaps, and even though, let's say, for example, People's Daily and China Daily, I think are registered. Actually, CCTV right now isn't registered, and I don't really know quite what the reason is for that. Um, but but I think when you have loopholes in enforcement, Which is that that's that actually a big part of the problem. They really should have been probably registered earlier. Correct. And I, yeah, I, I think that's actually, I would say that's an example of, of, of rules that we have in place to try to protect our societies from this kind of influence. Uh, that we're not doing a good job enough I our own of enforcement. I think the bigger question here is not I what <coughs> the U.S. does or Western countries do. It's that, you know, the Russian foreign agent law was modeled after FARA, okay? Wh how should we, what could we have done about that? You know, is the fact that they're setting the agenda on the narrative and we are falling behind for various reasons, far, far behind, right? Is that we're not responding, we're not putting our own narrative, our own positive agenda, um, whereas we're allowing the Russians kind of run with it. And that's what they've done. I do think most people have, including some of our media and reporting on this, buy into the notion that what the Russians are doing is reciprocal. It's not. Or that we were selective in, in, right. in identifying RT as, right. as a far, and this is somehow picking on Russia or picking on, on right. the Chinese. Yeah. I think what it speaks yeah. to also is that the, you know, the FARA Act, which came into being during the Second World War, um, simply wasn't on people's right. minds after the end of the Cold War. And in essence, you know, things <coughs> change, but our um, sensitivities to the nature of the problem didn't change. And now we're playing catch up, which does have the effect of kind of playing into yeah. a certain narrative, even if according to the rules, there should be a different, there should have been a different approach some time ago. So we have time for a few questions. Um, so we have a bunch of questions. So maybe what we'll do is we'll take um, three at a time. So let's, let's go all the way to the back first. We'll go to that gentleman. And then we'll work our way up towards the front. Uh, Oh. You could, I, I'm sorry, if you could identify yourself first. Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Masala Rifle from Liberia, and um, I'm with an organiz our organization, um, Refsa Inc. Education Consortium. Um, now I listen to what the, what the panel is saying, um, but I think um, in Africa, the game is played a little bit different. I agree with um, Alina on the, um, the, the way the Russians are doing it. I mean, it's like back um, in the Cold War, during the Cold War, and they brought it now to information, you know, uh, uh, they, you know, brought it down to, you know, information um, discussion, I would say. But um, like um, for the United States, for example, the United States now look at Africa like, I mean, it's a conglomeration of um, backward failed, st st failed states. And in dealing with Africa, it's more of condescension. And so the Chinese are seeing that as a big opportunity because Africa is a big continent and with one billion people. And for example, um, if you want to build, a, say, a power plant, how many United, I mean, engineers from the West can go to Africa in the village 
to live with the people and to do that where there is hardly drinking water, but the, the Chinese would do it. So when you talk about media, what comes on, on the media? They see the Chinese um, doing that. And last thing is that um, when you take the African elite, supported by, say, the United States or the West, um, when there is any little disturbance, what do we do? We run to the West. Now, the, um, the masses say, support, I mean, with the Chinese, how many of them would run to China? So the Chinese see that as another opportunity. And um, those are the things that are going on in, the, in Africa. Thank you. Um, why don't we come over here? Um, my name is Miriam, and I asked a question in the previous panel from e Collaborative for Civic Education. We're focused on Iran, but really, this my question uh, is is global. I wonder why we don't do more as a country, as a government, to combat. I mean, is it because we are preoccupied with our own problems, and the the presidential campaign went the way it did, and of course that has a lot to do with what we're talking about, the Russian disinformation and all of that. But why don't we? seriously clean up and improve VOA. I mean, if VOA Persian service is any indication, it's an absolute, absolute waste of money. It's a mess. Not only is it not doing what it's supposed to be doing, it's, it's because it's so awful and it's lost so much of the audience, it's actually making the United States look very weak in the eyes of the Iranian people and in the government. The Global Engagement Center, it was supposed to be up and running, it was supposed to be combating Russian disinformation, ISIS at the very least, and doing more. As far as I can tell, nothing is going on. In the previous panel, Juan Pablo talked about, we have no serious exchange program anymore where we deliberately seek to bring people of all kinds to the country, expose them to all the great things that this country is about. I mean, we're not, it's, not, it's like we're not fighting a war, a sharp power war, when, when the world really, at least Russia, China, Iran, is very much fighting against us. We're not, as a country, p members of Congress are not waking up to the fact that there is a war going on and that the, the casualties are serious, the, the, the national security interests are serious. If you can talk to that, that would be great. Because I think this needs to be a political consensus in this country to actually take it seriously. Okay, thank you for that. And we'll take one over here. Jerry, do you take one here, and then we'll do one more quick round, right? Yep, thank you. Uh, Jerry <coughs> Hammond, um, at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, I wonder if I could make a couple distinctions, but then ask you what the implication of all of this is. And it goes partly to Dan's question in the first panel. So I understand the difference between what these are authoritarian countries, no question about it. And what they do domestically and what they do abroad are going to be, clearly are going to be different. They don't have the ability to control abroad in the way that they do at home. So completely understand that. But I wonder whether you could talk a little bit about their objectives about and what the implications of those are for our own democracy and for our own country broader than just the democratic dimension. So it seems to me in Russia, it's clear that at the, at the extreme end, President Putin's objectives are, if possible, to reconstruct the Soviet Union. But I think even he doesn't think that's a possibility. So we have sort of a revanchist objective. And that's why he wants to undermine the European Union. He wants to try to undermine the, the, central, uh, the, the reforms in Central and, and Eastern Europe, Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to me <coughs> China is a bit different, though. But he doesn't, I don't think even, even Putin thinks that Russia is going to be a model for anybody. Uh, but I may be wrong, and so maybe you can correct that. Until the 19th Party Congress, neither did China. So we now have a different position, it seems to me, with Xi's speech at the 19th Congress, and that um, the sort of uh, abandonment of Deng Xiaoping's motto about keeping a low profile and don't don't be leading and so on and so forth, clearly that may, may be a different situation. I wonder if you think that she thinks that China is some kind of a model, a global model, and if that is there uh, as part of their objective. Great. L just one more quick question. So clearly the, the, these appeal to authoritarian governments, wherever they are. 
because they want to pattern themselves on the domestic dimension of that. But I are we in a, in a situation where this is really realpolitik of the interests of individual states and their individual economic, political, social interests rather than some kind of global uh, systemic conflict that we had in the Cold War? Okay, great. So I'm going to let um, the panelists respond to any portion of those questions, and then we'll try to squeeze in maybe just uh, one or two last ones. So, Jacek, do you want to go first in this mm -hmm. instance? Yes. Uh, I, I, on, on, uh, I, I fully agree with the need for more resources and to rejuvenate some initiatives that we knew either from the uh, times of Cold War, but also for me, more importantly, from 1990s. I think this, uh, the, the I, I, I one thing that I, I write in my report is, is about the, the, the actual gap on, and Jessica spoke about it in the first panel, the, the lack of exchange opportunities for, for the new generation of, of journalists, think tankers, people of culture to actually come to United States to uh, have a broader view of the country. I mean, the, there is this big contrast between <coughs> 1990s when my generation had all these opportunities uh, and now they, they, they very scarce. I mean, there are some, uh, some opportunities, but, but uh, th that's uh, really, really a drop in the sea of our needs, uh, if you may <laughs> use this expression. So I, I, I fully agree that th there is a need to take this challenge seriously, devote resources, but in a smart way, as I, as I said like really really know what we are doing and and why we are doing this uh, and then the o objectives of, of Russia and China I, I, I understand that it's especially uh, <coughs> with, with Russia it, it is a model and it is not a model because I think that the immediate aim of Russia is to say that at least we are not worse than the Western democracies so you are cr you criticize us but you are all hypocrites and basically that there is no difference but if you see at, at if you take a, one part of Russian sharp power which which is this, uh, uh, what I would call uh, conservative crusade, or, or, or whatever name you use it. In, 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 in former Soviet Union, there's this popular expression, Geiropa. It's this, this uh, uh, promotion of the idea that the West, and especially Western Europe, is morally corrupt, decadent, promotes gays and feminists, and, and that the Russia is a different country because it defends these values, it defends family, it defends the church, and, uh, and the, in a way that, that resonates in some of the societies. It, it resonates, so it, it's definitely in, in this aspect, the R Russian go, Russians go beyond the just promotion of, of chaos and, 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 uh, and political extremism. I mean, these two things are combined, but th there is an element of, of, of pretending a role model. With China, we already discussed it. I, I think that in case of these members of 16 plus 1 initiatives who are members of both NATO or European Union, there is uh, very clearly a primacy of political objectives over economic objectives. So that, that's, it, it, it is, I, I think, that a Chinese ways to get a foothold in these uh, organizations and possibly have more impact on, on their politics vis-a-vis -vis China. So I, I would say that this, this should be very clearly understood that this all uh, talk about economic opportunities is in many many cases basically a kind of uh, uh, mirage that is uh, uh, presented to the elites of, of, of these countries uh, to make them more susceptible uh, to Chinese political uh, agenda. Sarah? Um, so I, 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 I also agree. I think we're still waiting to see what happens with the GEC. I mean, I actually think, like, for example, in the Chinese context, RFA's reporting is very high quality. The quality of reporting on what's happening uh, also in the Uyghur and Tibetan services uh, is unparalleled because of the lack of access that Western journalists have. And here you have people who are locals who call, who call the local officials and cadres and get them confirming stories. And I think one thing I don't, I'm not familiar enough with is, you know, obviously RFA is very focused on, let's say, okay, how do we reach the populations in these places, inside China, in Tibet, in Xinjiang? I, I think there should be some effort, how do you reach the diaspora more? 
How do you reach the Chinese people in Australia? How, and of course, there are real restrictions on how do you reach um, Americans, uh, Chinese Americans, but there's actually some very, very high quality content that counters the Chinese, just by high quality factual reporting um, that, that exists in a treasure trove. And of course, people do uh, you know, read this online and things like that, but, but I know I think also in terms of funding issues, there are limitations on how much, for example, social media ads uh, uh, you can use U.S. government funding for to promote content like, let's say, RFA or other content that might counter this. So those would be certain things that might be regulatorily could, you know, be potentially worth opening to debate of whether a certain ways in which even U.S. government funding for these kinds of initiatives has worked in the past and perhaps would be worthy of, uh, of adjusting or making exceptions or seeing how to, to make it uh, uh, more realistic and more effective, uh, not just looking back to the 1990s, but really looking especially at the social media age and how people are, mm -hmm. are, are getting content and, and how important uh, in the Chinese, the Chinese diaspora is. Um, and then I think in terms of the question of the objectives and the implications, I, I mean, a big part, well, I, I think I talked earlier a little bit about I think what the Chinese government's objectives are. Uh, if you actually look at the way they talk about this and you look at how these patterns repeat and the specific even structures and departments and friendship associations, it's clearly a global strategy. Like this isn't just something, and there's adjustments for the local circumstances, which I think came up in these case studies. But this is, this is definitely, and it's definitely from coming from the Communist Party. This also isn't just like a Chinese government, Chinese state initiative. There are very specific departments in the Communist Party and very specific entities that are actively engaged in these kinds of initiatives. Um, and, and I think, uh, uh, so, so I don't think you could necessarily try to say, well, it's just, you know, you know in terms of one country's interests versus the other. There's definitely a kind of a global strategy here. I think in terms, and this goes back to the other professor's question in the last panel, I think there are potentially very profound implications for the health of democracies. I think we haven't fully seen that. I think you do start seeing that in, pla in, in Australia and New Zealand, that's coming up, where you're looking at uh, particular politicians uh, and him having, and also national security implications. I mean, this is again implications that go beyond necessarily just democratic development. But you have a person who had previously been uh, a, 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 a taught at a military uh, institution in China who was in high-level intelligence briefings uh, with the Prime Minister of New Zealand, and some of that intelligence was probably coming from the United States. So then that becomes a national security concern for the United States. Um, you have situations now where some of these, do you know, some of the donors in the conversation about political donations in Australia, uh, there was one media report talking about a veiled threat that, you know, we wouldn't want the Chinese government to, to, to encourage the Chinese community to not vote for a particular political party because they're not favorable to Australia and China relations. And I think that really goes to Yatsik's point where there are, kind of similar to what you were saying, there are elements of the Chinese diaspora who are actually quite active, who are very concerned about what's happening, especially in places like the United States, Canada, Australia, who have worked very hard in some cases to develop local diaspora media and they're being, in, in some cases, strangled. In other cases, they're actually being able to creatively use social media and be very, you know, increasingly successful. Um, and I think, you know, to the extent, again, in some cases they don't necessarily want U.S. government support, you know, because they also want to maintain some level of independence, but, but I think to the extent there can be, a, again, a recognition that those could be allies, I think that's really important because uh, you, you, this is happening and you want to be very careful, obviously, not to, you know, some of the conversations, debates can slide into xenophobia and, and racism, you want to be very careful about that, but I think being cognizant of, of the electoral implications of, 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 of diasporas that are intimidated, uh, co-opted, uh, and so forth um, uh, by, by foreign governments, you know, can be very real. Thank you, Sarah, and I know, uh, I know these we're two of our panelists time, have to go, so uh, I'm just gonna give Alina <coughs> a Yeah, just, just very quickly, um, you know, on the question of uh, why aren't we doing more, I think some of the initiatives you mentioned, that there are different reasons for why we are where we are with VOA, versus RFERL, um, and also the Global Engagement Center. Um, and, the engage and the exchanges, the Russians have actually themselves blocked off the ex exchanges, so it's not just our own problem. And I think we need to be careful not to see maliciousness and all of these things on our side as well, because despite the reporting on the money funding for GEC, which by the way, it's not its mission to fight propaganda, they're actually going to be externally fa facing, if you look at the language from the um, NDAA in which that funding passed, it is to actually fund initiatives abroad. There was not a U.S. focus there. Um, and I, I think there is consensus, a growing consensus, 
um, in Congress about these issues. Uh, the sanctions law that uh, passed and the president signed actually has 250 million allocated uh, that includes all these counter sharp power operations uh, the U.S. government can fund, um, again, abroad. Um, I think the bigger question is why aren't we doing something at home as well? And I mean, you know, the big elephant in the room is like, frankly, when you have a political leader, a president who doesn't actually believe that any of this happened, or he doesn't say he believes it, then what, how do we expect the government bureaucracy to actually uh, strategically reposition itself, right? So that, that does have a big role to play. And I've been surprised to see the extent to which we have been moving to do uh, uh, more in terms of allocating resources. And the reason the GAC hasn't gotten its money has nothing to do with maliciousness. There's just been uh, a lack of clarity, um, probably some inefficiency and perhaps some incompetence on the side of the State Department and the DOD to actually get that money to them. So I think th that's just the point I would make. Um, and, you know, we... Well, I just, I just, I do think that a lot of the reporting um, that you see in like Politico or elsewhere implies that there's some purposeful, um, you know, uh, maniacal conspiracy going on where the U.S. government is purposely not giving money to the GEC. I don't actually think that's what's happening at all. Um, and, 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 and in terms of VOA, like RFRL has launched this amazing uh, program in Russian called Current Time. It's actually very good. And it, they're broadcasting to where a large uh, Russian-speaking minority, so this goes to the diaspora question. Um, the VOA question, even though I, I respect and appreciate all of the uh, journalism that VOA reporters do, it is an institution that was set up during the Cold War era and, th and then deeply defunded. Um, and it's not really the same structure we need now to respond to threats in the age of digital technology. And, and I don't think we need to be, this goes back to your point, like we shouldn't join them in their game, right? So one thing we shouldn't do um, is set up a government bureaucracy that's going to put out uh, propaganda and try to interfere in other countries' elections, right? A top-down approach is just not an option. So it has to come from the bottom. It has to come from civil society. It has to come from independent media. They need money. And it's not just the U.S. government or other governments responsible for that. Foundations need to be more engaged. They need to care. And I do think we're, you know, one positive outcome of the U.S. elections and what the Russians did here um, is that there's a lot more movement on this now. All of us feel it. They've been working on this for a long time. We see more foundations interested. Every single think tank in town now has more disinformation initiative, um, you know. For better or for worse, I think the more voices, the more attention, the better. Um, so we are seeing movement. It's just democracies move much slower than authoritarian countries. And I, I would just uh, add on this question of whether there's a model that in a way it's an important question, but it's not um, the only question because both China and Russia can and do and have exerted considerable influence. So take the case of China and look at educational institutions, publishing, uh, entertainment, um, and media. And as Sarah alluded to, they're already setting the rules of the game when it comes to the Confucius Institutes. I suspect uh, Hollywood is not dissimilar in terms of who sets the, the benchmarks for what makes the cut for films entering China. We know this is happening with books to reach the Chinese market and with universities uh, who wish to engage in a variety of ways with China. So this is already happening, and I don't think they need to export their model to exert significant influence on the integrity of democratic political systems, and I think this is what shines through in all of these reports in their own way. I, I really apologize to those who had questions. We've gone behind, and I've already um, reneged on my commitment to Alina that I would get her out by 2.30. So I'd just like to thank everyone here uh, especially those who stayed for both sessions, those are the diehards. Um, <laughs> and uh, encourage you to take a close look at the report if you haven't done already. And thanks very much to all of our panelists.